is a capable aircraft. Ask any soldier who's been dependent on air resupply for his food and fuel. With aviation personnel, the Iroquois rates high for mechanical dependability. But even the best mechanical devices can fail. Because of this possibility, you must be prepared to deal with critical flight conditions. We will discuss seven critical conditions and explain the emergency procedures used in dealing with them. They are engine failure, tail rotor failure, fuel system failure, engine fire, hydraulic power failure, torsion, and high sink rate. Total engine failure is rare in the Iroquois. Usually a defective engine will give ample indication of its condition during run-up, but any engine can fail. Should it occur when the Iroquois is at a hover, pilot procedure is very simple. Indications of engine failure are a slight change in the sound of the turbine and a sinking of the aircraft. Adjust the pedals to compensate for loss of torque. When this occurs, keep the Iroquois level with cyclic control pressure. Freeze the pitch and allow the Iroquois to settle. Just before contacting the ground, increase pitch to cushion the touchdown. Perhaps the most important caution concerning any engine failure or malfunction is to definitely locate and correct the cause of malfunction before attempting to restart the engine. When engine failure occurs during takeoff, pilot technique is much the same. The first signs of trouble will be a sensation of loss of power. Do not reduce your forward speed. And to conserve your rotor RPM, do not adjust collective pitch until cushioning touchdown. If you experience engine failure in flight, everything you've learned about auto rotations will come in handy. Again, your primary objective is to conserve rotor RPM. After you've reduced pitch to maintain rotor RPM, select the best feasible landing site and plan your approach and auto rotative landing. Attempting to restart the engine is seldom good practice. Before the deceleration stages of auto rotation, turn off the battery switch, fuel and oil switches, and lock your shoulder harness. Deceleration is started when the rate of closure and ground speed appear to be increasing. With a good selection of a landing site and a properly maintained rotor RPM, the touchdown should be as smooth as any auto rotation. The important point to remember in the event of engine failure in any flight configuration or at any altitude is to maintain adequate rotor RPM to provide control of the aircraft. Tail rotor failure is extremely rare, but if it should occur, you must be prepared to recognize it and to react with the proper procedure. There are two forces which prevent torque from rotating the fuselage of an Iroquois in the direction opposite to the revolution of the main rotor. One force is the counteracting effect of the tail rotor. This force is effective at all times. The other force is in effect only when the Iroquois is in forward flight. It is the streamlining effect of the relative wind passing over the fuselage. For streamlining to be effective, airspeed must be at least 50 knots. 
If you are at a hover, there is only one force to prevent fuselage rotation, the tail rotor. If tail rotor failure occurs, you will know it immediately. The Iroquois will start to rotate clockwise with no pedal control. Close the throttle immediately to stop fuselage rotation. Maintain a level attitude with cyclic control to avoid serious damage on touchdown. Pull pitch to cushion the touchdown just before ground contact. If you are in flight at a normal cruise, you may not be aware of tail rotor failure immediately. Because of streamlining, the fuselage will not rotate. Your first indication will be a lack of response to pedal movement. The pedals will be totally ineffective. Select an emergency landing site which you can approach into the wind. With cyclic alone, you can turn the helicopter, provided you do it gently, and provided that you maintain better than 50 knots airspeed. When you're in an upwind position to this site, start your auto rotation. Throughout the descent, maintain an airspeed of above 50 knots to prevent fuselage rotation. Check to see if your shoulder harness is locked. At an altitude of approximately 50 feet, assume a decelerating attitude. There will be only a slight tendency toward fuselage rotation since the main rotors are not being driven by the engine. At about six to eight feet above the surface, level the helicopter. With the aircraft level, cushion the landing. There may be some fuselage rotation and the touchdown will very likely not be the smoothest you've ever made. If you have a tail rotor failure, maintain 50 knots airspeed as far down in auto rotation as feasible. With tail rotor failure at a hover, close the throttle immediately to reduce the violence of rotation. Fuel system failure may be one of three types. Malfunction of one or the other of the fuel boost pumps. Malfunction of the engine driven fuel pump. Or malfunction of the fuel control unit. Failure of a fuel boost pump will be indicated by the master caution light flashing on. And illumination of one of the fuel boost pump segments on the caution panel. Here is the emergency procedure for indicated boost pump failure. If at an altitude above 5,000 feet, descend to a pressure altitude of less than 5,000 feet. Below 5,000 feet, the engine fuel pump can supply adequate pressure even if both boost pumps should fail. While descending, check your fuel switches to be sure nothing has been accidentally turned off. And check that the appropriate circuit breakers are in. It is possible, though unlikely, that both boost pumps might fail. If this happens above 5,000 feet, your engine will likely fail. If this occurs, emergency procedure would be to establish an auto-rotative glide. Auto-rotation may be completed to the ground, or an engine restart may be attempted if time permits. The engine fuel pump is a dual element device. Either element is capable of providing engine fuel requirements. It's fail-safe design make specific emergency procedure unnecessary. However, the flight should be terminated as soon as practicable. Malfunction of the fuel control unit will result in too much or too little fuel being fed into the engine. 
When all reported deficiencies have been examined and corrected to your satisfaction, conduct your own pre-flight inspection. Start looking for those deficiencies that others may have overlooked. You are the aviator, and you are the one who has to cope with critical conditions in flight. Let us quickly review these conditions and the procedures necessary to cope with them. Engine failure, maintain rotor RPM. Tail rotor failure, streamline with airspeed. Fuel system failure, this is rare. If the control unit fails, maintain RPM with manual throttle. Engine fire, use emergency governor and continue to crank. Hydraulic power failure. Ease airspeed and make a running landing. Torsion. Back off throttle. High sink rate. Avoided with control technique. You cannot avoid every in-flight emergency by being extremely thorough in pre-flight, but your thoroughness will be well paid for if during your career as an aviator you discover just one critical situation before you have to deal with it in flight. The inspection to discover malfunctions and critical conditions does not cease with the completion of the pre-flight. This inspection is continuous and constant. It goes on during starting, run-up, while taxiing, and before takeoff. Your ability to analyze malfunctions and to correctly deal with critical flight conditions whenever and wherever they happen is the mark of a professional aviator. And it's your best insurance for a safe and successful mission. lethal weapons. Their one purpose, the sole reason for their existence, is to knock enemy planes out of the sky. They are P-38s, and they rank with the fastest and best fighters in the air today. Now the fact that this is a two-engine airplane does not mean that it's a difficult airplane to fly. On the other hand, the two engines do give it a wide range of performance and extra margins of safety. Some hangar experts insist that it is impossible to bail out of the 38 because of the twin booms and rudders and because of the horizontal stabilizer span. The truth is that it is no easier or harder to bail out of the 38 than out of any single-seater fighter. Bailouts can be made either, one, by turning the plane on its back and dropping out, or two, by getting out the left window and sliding down the wing. Now, don't stand on the wing to jump. The span of the horizontal stabilizer just doesn't affect the bailout. At high speeds, the airflow carries any object straight back and under the empennage, which is actually higher than the wing. Therefore, the only portion of the empennage which is critical is that portion directly aft of the bailout area. Thus, it doesn't matter whether the empennage has a 20-foot span or a 100-foot span. The critical area is still the same. Furthermore, on the 38, there's no vertical stabilizer which can get in the way. Actually, however, the object isn't to bail out of your ship, but to make the other fellow bail out of his. In the 38, you have a weapon which will help you do just that. It's a fighting man's airplane. Top, rugged, reliable. Its high-speed performance is well known. is equally spectacular from the point of view of performance. Presented here with is a new type of airplane, a primary trainer escort, under absolute control at 90 miles an hour indicated. Now, 
Watch its acceleration. Most important of all, maximum performance makes it possible for a 38 pilot to dictate when and at what altitude he shall combat. But to achieve that maximum performance, it is first necessary to understand normal and emergency operations. What we're about to see won't give us any laughs or thrills. But in the thick of battle when the going is tough, it might mean the difference between victory or defeat, life or death. Among other things, we'll see what to do for normal routine precautions. For single engine flight, landing, and single engine failure on takeoff. How to handle one or both propellers in operative, or so-called running wild. We will check on use of landing gear and flap emergency extension systems. All of these will be seen for the purpose of achieving the true objective of the airplane maximum performance in combat, and the men best qualified to demonstrate these operations are the men who know the 38 best, the men who have flown them the most, production pilots. Charlie Brannan, Tom Kennedy, Jimmy Mattern, Avery Black, the pilot who's flown more 38s than any other man is going to take it up from here. He's the chief engineering test pilot. Milo Bircher. We're not going to try to teach you how to fly. You've all had good training in other ships. We're simply going to show you how we handle a 38, hoping to increase your knowledge and skill, and in that way, add to the effectiveness of the ship and to your own safety. There are certain routine precautions which apply to every condition on every flight. So let's take a look at those right off the bat. Before takeoff, the hatch must always be securely latched. Both sliding windows must also be closed all the way. With the windows closed, the airflow is normal. But if the windows are carelessly left open, the airflow is disturbed and causes the wake to hit the tail. On airplanes equipped with external tanks, it is essential to be able to drop the tanks immediately in case of engine failure on takeoff. Therefore, before starting, the drop tank switch is placed in the safe position and the drop tank selectors are placed on so that in an emergency we can lose the tanks by simply punching the drop tank release button. When the full fuel load is carried, takeoffs are always on the front tanks. Normally, we use no flaps. Later, we will check on conditions where flaps are used. but. At all times, maximum allowable manifold pressure is used. Once in position at the head of the line and after run-up and mag check, propellers are checked in the automatic position. By trying the governors, we make certain that they're really governing. Booster pumps are switched on in order to ensure adequate fuel pressure in the event of engine fuel pump failure. Brakes are held while both throttles are advanced to get the maximum allowable manifold pressure. In this case, 40 inches. The object is to get those turbos turning so as to obtain takeoff power at the start of the takeoff run. Furthermore, by holding the brakes as long as possible, we allow the propellers to reach the governing limit of 3,000 RPM at the start of the run. In that way, if they're gonna run wild, They'll do it while there's still time to stop the ship. Now, without flaps and using 40 inches of manifold pressure, the 38 starts the takeoff run. Because of the tricycle gear, however, there is no tendency on the part of the airplane to fly itself. Therefore, at about 70 miles an hour, we start to ease back on the stick. At 90 to 100 indicated, after a run of 15 to 1800 feet, we pull back to break ground. At this point, in spite of the lack of a feeling of lightness, the airplane responds immediately and easily. Gear is up as soon as the ship is committed to flight. By the time the gear retracts, 
Indicated airspeed will be at least 150. Well above single engine operation speed of 120. If the boom doors do not close immediately, nosing the plane abruptly down a couple of times usually will close the doors. No flaps are used for normal takeoff because without them, we get the single engine flying speed faster. But if this tower, for instance, were an obstacle 1,700 feet from the head of the runway, a zero flap takeoff would catch it right amidships. With 50% flaps under exactly the same conditions, the airplane easily clears the tower. Airspeed will be at least 140 indicated by the time the gear retracts, which is enough speed to retract the flaps without loss of altitude. Although flaps reduce takeoff run about 500 feet, they only provide a takeoff goose because the rate of climb and speed at zero flaps quickly exceed the initial advantage with flaps. As soon as the airplane is in its climb, power is reduced to 37 inches of manifold pressure and 2600 RPM. At this time, if high altitude flight is not contemplated, booster pumps can be turned off. There's very little difference in the rate of climb at indicated speeds of 140 to 180 because what is gained by the angle increase is lost in speed. The flight characteristics of the 38 are excellent. For example, the stall, which we're about to see, is so slight as to be almost imperceptible to the camera. The power stall will occur at about 70 miles an hour. Loss of altitude will be about 50 feet. The counter-rotating propellers eliminate torque. No tendency of either wing to dip or fall away. Watch closely. There's the stall. Characteristics are just as good in the power-off stall with gear and flaps retracted or extended. Accelerated stalls, accompanied by normal buffeting, occur on any airplane when the angle of attack is increased to the point that the airflow over the wing becomes turbulent. This can happen in sharp turns, pull-outs, or other severe maneuvers. The 38 is designed to take the buffeting of the stall and has no tendency to slip off on either wing at any altitude. If you want to get out of an accelerated stall, permit the airflow to re-establish normal lift by easing up on the stick. For the sake of greater maneuverability, there is a maneuvering stop on the flap control. With flaps in this position, turns are shortened, and similar maneuvers perform with great efficiency. Low speed banks at low levels, however, even with the flaps pulled down, are non-habit forming. <laughs> There's just not going to be enough time to recover lost altitude before the ground catches up with you. And in practicing maneuvers, there are two things that are darn important. First, where inverted flight is concerned, the engines are not designed for inverted flight of more than 10 seconds. Oil pressure will drop in even less time and the bearings are apt to be damaged. Furthermore, prolonged inverted flight is in itself unnecessary. Secondly, in any maneuver which requires a downward recovery, the pilot must have plenty of air under him, at least 10,000 feet. Due to the 38's acceleration in a dive, the ground comes up awfully fast to slap you in the face. There's a dive limit chart in the cockpit. Be sure to check it. Landings are not complicated, but in night landings, pilots new to the 38 sometimes get a surprise when lowering the landing light. This is due to the fact that the light disturbs the airflow to the aileron. This nibbling feels a bit strange at first, but actually has no unfavorable effect as far as flying is concerned. For the landing itself, propellers are set for 2600 RPM with about 23 inches of manifold pressure. And to ensure adequate fuel pressure, on go the booster pumps. Gear is extended at 175 miles an hour indicated. Flaps at 150. At this time, the tow brake should be pumped to ensure adequate pressure upon landing. Now let's retract the gear again to show that even if the normal extension system fails, there is still no reason to start getting ideas about a belly landing. Two conditions are usually the cause of hydraulic system failure. Either the engine hydraulic pump has gone out or there's a break in the hydraulic lines. If the engine pump goes out, 
fluid will still be in the lines and the auxiliary hand pump can be used to extend both the gear and flaps. No other action except pumping is required and it will take about five minutes to pump the gear down and lock. If, after two or three minutes of pumping, there is no feeling of pressure against the pump, it indicates that there is fluid failure. In this case, the emergency system is still on tap. The emergency extension system is used in the following sequence. First, landing gear control lever is placed down. Next, the bypass valve is closed by turning it clockwise. Now the hand pump selector valve handle is placed down and the pump is operated to force the doors open with the wheels. Pumping is continued until all three wheels are fully extended and locked. Nosing the ship abruptly up will help force the wheels out. While pumping, the selector valve handle should be checked down to make sure it hasn't moved out of position. Flaps can also be extended by the hand pump. To do this, the flap control handle is placed down. Then the selector valve handle is set to up and the pump operated till the flaps are extended the desired amount. If for any reason the flaps will not extend, the airplane lands well enough without them. In a zero flap landing, however, allow for float and higher stalling speed. With booster pumps on, the gear down and flaps in 50% position, the approach is made at 120 miles an hour indicated. Speed is reduced to 110. And when the approach is in the bag, the flaps are extended full down. Then, at 110, flare out and come in over the fence at 100 to 105 miles an hour, but never faster than 110. Contact never has to be made at over 100 miles an hour. The 38 lands in the same attitude as ships with conventional gear on the two main wheels. The nose wheel will settle of its own accord. Don't be tricycle gear conscious. Just be flying level somewhere near the ground. Flying, not falling. And then the less the pilot does, the better. For slowing down, brakes are applied on and off, rather than with a constant pressure. There is only one way possible to make landing the 38 difficult. Try to bring it in on its nose wheel. Nose wheel landings are expensive ways of messing up the landscape. And sometime or other, Everybody feels a little sorry for pilots just starting to fly single-seat fighters. Second-hand information doesn't apply anymore to pilots graduating to the 38 because an instruction version is now available as a two-place airplane. The boys call it the piggyback. Now a new pilot can ride in back of the instructor and have any procedure cleared up for him in flight. This is how it works. A couple of weeks ago, a new 38 Army pilot visited the field and asked if we'd take him up in the piggyback for single-engine procedure. Wrap your legs up, Bill, and make yourself at home. Come on, Dave. This being a passenger is a good deal. I feel like a colonel already. Hmm, the last guy thought he was a general. <laughs> 
Well, all kidding aside, Milo, I hope you don't think me a dope if I ask a lot of fool questions. You know a better way of finding something out? Well, no, but... Well, then ask away. Okay. Well, I did have a couple of question marks about the propellers running wild. Not that I don't understand perfectly, but... Well, you know, it just isn't quite clear. Well, there's nothing serious about propellers running wild. No? It usually simply means that they're caught in full high RPM. And as a result, the engines are overspeeding. This can happen due to a shortened electrical system, or the switch is being left in manual instead of automatic. Or maybe the circuit breaker switches are out at the start. Uh, but no matter what causes propeller over-revving, retarding the throttles will bring them under control and still leave enough power to at least circle the field and land. Propellers will run wild if, through carelessness, the propeller switches are left in manual instead of being checked in automatic. In this case, RPMs will be reduced by simply throwing the switches where they belong, in automatic. On late versions of the 38, warning lights go on when there's a short in the circuit. If a short occurs, the circuit breakers overheat and jump up. When they do, push the circuit breakers down. They'll have to be held down for about 15 seconds. Otherwise, the heat will just make them jump right back. I got gotcha. you. If we don't let them cool off, we'll pop right back up again. Can we simulate this in flight? When we get in the air, you'll see that holding the circuit breakers down for 15 seconds has disadvantages. But now we're ready for the takeoff check. Propellers and automatic. Governing check. Booster pumps on, tow brakes held, throttles advanced to get maximum allowable manifold pressure. warn us that there's a short and the propellers jump from 3,000 to 3,500 rpm. Shoving down the circuit breakers will help control the propellers but the 15 seconds that they have to be held down is a long time in flying to have one hand committed to a single action. Therefore it's better to retard the throttles and bring the rpms down to 3,000 while still maintaining sufficient power to establish level flight before pushing the circuit breakers down. Now, with flight established, the circuit breakers can be held down. And if they stay down, as much power as is desired can be put on, and the propellers will be governing properly. If one engine were damaged by over-revving, the propeller would be feathered right away, and single engine flight would be necessary. But correct single engine flight procedure must be followed. There are only three main steps. The first step will be to set the den engine mixture control to idle cutoff so as to reduce fire hazard by stopping the flow of fuel at once. Furthermore, if by mistake we try to kill the engine that's operating, the complete loss of power warns us while there's still time to recover. So if the right engine were to quit, the three main steps would be, first, right mixture control to idle cutoff. Second, right feathering switch to full feather, and third, right throttle back to close. That's all there is to getting set for single engine flight. If the flight is going to be for any duration though, there are five more simple operations which are mainly precautionary and intended to reduce drag. Turn the right booster pump off, Trim the rudder tab, close the right tank selector valve, close the right press tone shutter, and close the right oil cooler flap. Now that's one of the handy features of the 38. If one engine fails, there's still a mighty fine single engine ship under us. There's no difference in flight technique with either engine. But for demonstration, we'd like to fly on the left engine and keep the generator going rather than use the right engine and run on the battery. 
What we've just checked over have been the emergency procedures for single engine failure. But for practicing single engine operation and maneuvers, slightly different procedures are followed so that, if necessary, the simulated dead engine can be brought back into operation quickly. In the first place, be awfully sure that the live engine is on the tank with the most fuel. Then, and only then, start the procedure for single engine practice flight. Now, turn the right booster pump off. Then by retarding the right throttle, single engine failure and the resultant yaw will be simulated. Recover from yaw with opposite rudder and throw the right mixture control to idle cutoff and feather up. After the engine has stopped, trim the rudder tab and fare the right press stone shutter and right oil cooler flap. After the engine has stopped and the ship is trimmed, the control should be set in position for immediate unfeathering just in case something should happen to the engine we're flying on and we have to use the engine being simulated as dead. So, as soon as the propeller is feathered, set the feathering switch in the normal position. Then, raise the guard on the manual propeller switch to the dead engine and set it to the fixed position and move the governor control to low RPM. Now, with the feathering switch in normal position, the manual propeller switch to the dead engine in fixed pitch position and the right governor control in low RPM, we can continue single engine practice flight safely. Unfeathering to resume normal two engine flight takes only four steps. Manual propeller switch is held to increase RPM until 800 is reached, and then throw the switch to the automatic position. Right mixture control is set to water rich. Check to make sure that there is sufficient oil and fuel pressure. Open the throttle slowly, and as the press tone temperature rises, continue advancing it slowly. At 25 inches of manifold pressure, RPMs are also increased until power and propellers on both engines are synchronized. In unfeathering, we have to advance the throttle slowly because the dead engine has cooled off and sudden application of power would be apt to result in serious backfiring. But no matter if the single engine flight is due to necessity or for the sake of practice, the procedures for flight and landing will be the same. For single engine cruising, satisfactory power is 31 inches of mercury and 2300 RPM. For single engine climb, 37 inches of mercury and 2600 RPM are satisfactory. Use of more power is unnecessary and depends on the weight conditions of the plane. At an altitude of 20,000 feet, the 38 on one 1150 horsepower engine can hit 205 miles an hour indicated airspeed. Figuring pressure and outside air temperature, the true speed is actually about 282 miles an hour. Loss of range in flying on one engine is about 20%. In cases of prolonged single engine flight, fuel will have to be drawn from the tanks of the dead engine. Now, Bill, you reach over to do this. First, turn the selector to the tank which is to supply fuel. Then set the cross-feed valve switch to cross-feed position and turn the other selector off. The single engine maneuvers we're about to go through are to show the flexibility of the ship and are recommended only for combat emergency. A single engine aileron roll is simple enough. But the engine design, as we know, doesn't allow inverted flight of more than 10 seconds due to the loss of oil pressure. The single engine stall characteristics are at least the equal of most single engine planes. The power stall occurs at 90 miles indicated and the recovery is the same as with two engines. Now here's the stall. There's a big change in directional trim with change in speed comparable to the torque effect in single engine airplanes. This is more pronounced in the slow speed range. At high speed, the trim approaches the normal for twin engine operation. And now while we're heading back for a landing, there's one important thing to keep in mind. Never count on a two engine plane maintaining altitude on one engine with both the gear and flaps full down. 
The landing approach is made at 2,600 RPM with 20 inches of manifold pressure. At about 160, gear is let down. Dab control will be set at zero because there's very little torque with low power. At 135 miles an hour, flaps are extended 50%. Power and speed are decreased in the approach pattern, but 120 is maintained throughout the approach. Once full flaps are extended, the landing must be made. There is no choice in the matter. So only extend flaps 100% when you see it's in the bag. Retard the throttle and come in over the fence at 110. Then flare out, making contact at between 95 and 100 miles an hour. If I'd known how easy that baby flies on one engine, I'd never have bothered. Well, it's not easy and it's not hard. Just know how to practice. Here, Bill, this will give you some idea of what I mean. To fly an approach on single engine is definitely bad. It's apt to result in undershooting the field. The high approach can be made by diving down and leveling off short of the field. But the recommended approach has been found to be the easiest as well as the safest. It's okay to use some power to actually contact the ground. Uh-huh. Hey, one engine's quit. You still got another engine. He made it, but boy, come here, I want to show you something. I think that's Tony LeVere. Uh, Tony, simulate single engine failure on takeoff. Okay, Milo, I'll cut the right engine. The right engine will quit at 120. Power is reduced and hard left rudder to check yaw. Power increased. Drop tank release button punch to drop the tanks. Right mixture control off. Full feather right propeller. Right throttle off. The other procedures are carried out while level flight is maintained until 140 miles an hour. And now he climbs to a safe altitude. Remember, Bill, this is your first crack at it, so take it easy. Okay. Side windows closed, hatch secure. Straighten nose wheel. Nose wheel straight. Drop tank switch at safe. Selectors on. on left engine. Make sure that you'll be on the tank with the most fuel. Switching from front to rear main. Right booster pump off and set the cut throttle. Go to it. Right throttle off, hard left rudder to check yaw. Mixture control to idle cutoff. Right propeller feathered up. Right engine is dead. Trimming rudder tab. Closing right Prestone shutter. 
and right oil cooler flap. How's about setting the controls for unfeathering? Uh-oh. Feathering switch in normal position. Manual propeller switch in fixed position. Right governor control in low RPM. All set and smooth as silk. Nice going. Now circle for landing. Twenty-six hundred RPM with twenty inches. Tap control set at zero. Gear down at one hundred and sixty. Fifty percent flat. It's in the bag. The 38 as a weapon does not have to take a back seat to any plane in the world. It's a man's airplane, effective and versatile. But remember that it is an airplane, and don't lose respect for it. Learn to take advantage of its strong features, both of safety and attack. The skies belong to you.